Fury is a 2014 movie with Brad Pitt, which is ostensibly about the last few days of an American Sherman tank crew in the European theater in the last year of the war. The movie has been picked to death by military and history buffs, but none have really caught the ultimate underlying story. It could just as easily be a PT boat, a bomber, an infantry unit, or even a police squad. The story is about one of acceptance into an organization, a family, one under constant threat. It is a story of Norman, a name I believe was deliberately chosen because of its similarity to normal. It is a story of how a normal kid from the heartland of America, an every man's any man, can be forced to fight against his life's upbringing and find his inner evolutionary dark side. The movie begins with a juxtaposition. A German officer on a horse rides through a battlefield full of knocked out armor from both sides. It is allegorical to the changing times as the German army was still largely horsebound, but it confronted a fully mechanized allied army. This is where we are introduced to Staff Sergeant Don Bordaddy Collier. He leaps from his tank, the titular Fury, and knocks the German officer off of his horse and then kills him with a World War I trench knife. The officer's death is sudden, violent, and quick. We see from the start that War Daddy is an efficient and ruthless soldier. The officer he killed was an army officer, an Oberleutnant, first lieutenant, with at least three awards for valor, which appear to be the Knight's Cross, the Iron Cross second class, and the Iron Cross third class. This shows that he was also an experienced soldier and ergo not an easy kill. This further adds to War Daddy's character as a dangerous enemy. Yet as soon as the fight is over, War Daddy gently unbridles the German's horse, demonstrating an affinity for horses, and sets it free. Yet War Daddy is not some Superman. He has a human side that is slowly being destroyed by the things he must do to carry out his mission, not to the enemy, but to his own men. As he gets back in the tank, we see the rest of his crew. The gunner, Boyd Swan, a Christian man who is somewhat educated and well-versed in biblical scripture, giving him the nickname Bible. The loader, Private Grady Travis, is called Kunaz, a North Georgia redneck who stands out in contrast to Bible for being crass, uncultured, and in the need of constant and strict supervision to keep him in line. Lastly is the driver, Corporal Trini Garcia, who goes by the nickname Gordo, which is Spanish for fat. Each character fills a role not only in the performance of the tank, but in the structure of a militarily efficient, if not socially dysfunctional, family. War Daddy is the undisputed father figure, both by rank, leadership capability, and demeanor. Bible is the good elder son, Gordo is the oft overlooked middle son, and Grady is the problem child. With that said, they are all good at their jobs, and they trust each other. By being constantly under threat together, they have become welded into a team, a family. Then they have a disrupted influence thrust into their tiny steel encased world. They have just lost their assistant driver who operates the bow machine gun on the front of the tank. The loss of a friend and valued crewman is not taken lightly by the crew. An unseen sergeant throws them a warm body in the form of the movie's real protagonist, Private Norman Ellis. A fresh off the boat clerk typist who has been effectively shanghaied into tank service. To say Norman is about to undergo culture shock would be beyond an understatement. War Daddy rightly does not want Norman. He can tell that he will be little more than a liability to the crew. Realizing that it's Norman or no one, War Daddy takes him. The crew instinctually do not care for Norman, much as a nuclear family might resent an unwanted foster sibling. They do offer some insights to Norman and occasionally try to help him, such as when Bible warns him about how he will be affected once he has seen what a man can do to another man. Norman's first job is to clean up the remains of his predecessor from inside the tank. The result of this is predictable, but while he loses his lunch, he sees a piece of religious iconography which forebears an ever more horrifying sight a truck full of dead American soldiers. 
Norman is being gradually broken down by terror from the harsh reality of war, and he has not even been in a fight yet. A new shock awaits Norman when he sees War Daddy beat a captured Waffen SS soldier. War Daddy makes it clear to Norman that SS are the worst of all the Nazis and they are to be killed on sight. No exceptions. Norman is seeing his entire ethos challenged. On top of that, he has to learn his job on the job. As they travel and pass refugees, Norman is told that he can get starving German girls to sleep with him for a candy bar or even a few cigarettes. Norman does not want to believe it. He has been taught to hold female virtue high and cannot conceive of bribing a girl with something so minor as a candy bar. But then, Norman has never been starving. As they move forward, Norman sees something moving in the brush. He holds his fire because he does not know what it is. He feels he cannot just open fire on what might be kids or civilians. It turns out to be kids all right, armed with Panzerfaust anti-tank weapons. They hit the lead tank in the ready rack of cannon rounds and the ammunition supply erupts into flames. No doubt stunned by the blast, the crew are unable to get out immediately and all are consumed by flame. The lieutenant in the top hatch manages to extricate himself, but he's engulfed in flames and uses his service pistol to shoot himself. As Norman sits in stunned silence, War Daddy swings into action shooting the attackers. He goes in the woods to see his attackers were children. His hatred for the Nazis only grows. He holds Norman responsible for this. His failure has cost them five people and a tank, plus the only officer they had left. Norman's apologies for his failure fall on deaf ears as his humanity has cost them dearly. Norman simply cannot process what he must do, and the crew's patience is wearing thin. At this point, War Daddy has to take control of the column and carry on with the mission. The next job is to rescue an infantry platoon that's pinned down in an open field. In this fight, Norman finally fires his weapon, but he shoots all over the place. He gets caught reloading by a German with another Panzerfaust. He cannot shoot, but Bible is able to get him with the coaxial gun. When they get up on the enemy positions, Norman is told to shoot the dead to make sure they are dead. He refuses and cannot see the purpose. The tankers dismount and fight on foot, but Norman refuses to join in. This worries War Daddy. He lectures Norman, who refuses to give in to the barbaric and seemingly unnecessary acts of violence. As the rest of the crew handles the post-battle differently, Gordo drinks, Bible comforts a dying soldier, Grady loots the German dead, War Daddy gets an idea. He sees a prisoner who was caught wearing an American GI coat that technically classifies him as a spy and warrants a summary execution. A true hypocrisy is War Daddy's own commanding officer wears a captured German officer's coat. War Daddy knows the infantry are going to shoot the German and tells Norman to do it. Norman is so repelled by the idea that he tells War Daddy to shoot him instead. So strong is Norman's belief in right and wrong that he would rather die than commit murder. But War Daddy isn't having it. He needs a complete working crew and for better or worse, Norman is what he has got. So Norman has got to come up to speed. War Daddy's code is as strong as Norman's. The German, who is a pathetic soul, cold, underfed and scared, tries to elicit mercy by showing pictures of his family, but to no avail. The Americans, who have been watching their friends die and have seen the German atrocities, are unmoved. War Daddy physically makes Norman execute the German. Afterward, Norman drops to the ground and literally gets a kick in the ass from War Daddy. The rest of the crew begin to show a hint of camaraderie to a sulking Norman. They even offer a few embarrassing stories of their own about their first combat mistakes. You realize that they have all been through what Norman is going through. They were not born brutal men, they devolved into them. War Daddy goes off and has a private emotional moment as he looks at the gun he used. He knows he is breaking Norman's worldview. He clearly hates what he must do, but it must be done. He returns to the tank with a much softer tone, even a caring demeanor, and tells them they're moving out, but first Norman, who's had no food all day, needs to eat. As Norman stands there, the normally abusive Grady tells him he should do what War Daddy says and to make sure that he sees Norman eating. There's almost a caring tone in Grady's voice. 
As they move deeper into Germany, they see more and more of the detritus of war and the desperation of the starving Germans, followed by their atrocities, which are now being leveled at their own people for refusing to fight. Norman is losing his old self as he starts to see the need for killing the enemy. The next battle is in a small German city. A sniper shoots an elderly German for pointing out where the German troops are. Norman mans his gun but holds his fire and watches the street as there's already plenty of firepower on the target. When the infantry walk into an ambush, there's no way for Norman to use his gun so the tank behind him does it. But when they go around a corner, they drive right into an anti tank gun. It glances a shot off a of fury and Bible puts two white phosphorus rounds into it at close range. When the Germans come running out, they're burning from inextinguishable phosphorus. The infantry is content to let them burn, so Norman performs a mercy killing. War Daddy is satisfied that at least Norman is learning to kill and able to keep his rounds on target. After this, the Germans surrender and the ones remaining are mostly children and old men. They do find an SS Sturmfuhrer, roughly a lieutenant, and once they learn that he's the one who hung the children, he's executed on the spot. In this case, Norman is unmoved. No outcry of right and wrong. Another part of the old Norman is gone. After this battle, Norman is quite serene. He's just reading a book. When War Daddy compliments his work, Norman says he thinks he enjoyed it. This comes across as a bit disingenuous, so War Daddy takes him for a walk. They go to the local party headquarters where all the senior Nazis and their women have gotten drunk and committed suicide. He shows us the Norman so he can better conceive the evil they're fighting. The two men then find two German women alone in their apartment. The two terrified women are put slightly at ease by War Daddy's ability to speak German. The younger one, Ella, and Norman manage to actually have chemistry. Despite everything, they are both young and relatively innocent in a time of horror. War Daddy sees the chemistry between Norman and Ella and essentially forces Norman to seduce her by threatening to do it himself if Norman does not. At this point, the two need little encouragement. Afterwards, we actually see Norman smile for the first time in the movie. He's crossed another barrier. Despite genuine feelings for Ella, he has used his position, albeit under persuasion, to bet a woman. War Daddy has used the time to shave and clean up. This is where we see massive burn scars about his body. We assume they are combat wounds, but we'll get into that later. They sit down to eat almost like a normal family when the rest of the crew show up and they are drunk. The following scene took me a little while to understand, but now I realize why the crew is so irritated to find Norman and War Daddy in this situation. Even the normally level-headed Bible is upset. Essentially, I break it down like this. The crew are tight, a family, a unit, when they are in battle. But now, in a moment of normalcy, War Daddy has turned his back on that family. He's turned back into Don Collier, an almost normal man, and he has chosen to do so with Norman. The rest of the gang was not invited. Grady's the worst offender as he thinks he can just invite himself onto Ella's bed. Norman simply is not tough enough to stop him, so Sergeant Collier goes back to being War Daddy just long enough to keep him from going too far. They all sit down to eat, but the crew is both mad at War Daddy and jealous of Norman. The girls, especially Ella, are basically terrified. But it's Gordo who really ruins the mood, not with a threat, but with a story. He tells of the Battle of the Filet's pocket where a large number of heavily horsebound German units were shredded following an encirclement. The crew had to spend days killing wounded horses, something none of them enjoyed, especially War Daddy, who loves horses. With the mood destroyed, a messenger comes in and breaks the tension. The war is back on. As they prepare to leave the town, they come under German artillery fire. The crew is okay, but one shell hits Ella's apartment, killing both women. Norman tries to dig her out of the rubble, but Grady drags him back to the tank. As Norman wildly swings at him, Grady sees the genuine heartbreak and anger in Norman's eyes. He grabs him, and even the not-so-bright Grady sees the chance to make Norman grasp the nature of the situation. He tells him, 
This is war. Norman is thrown back on the tank, now a nearly broken man. Now he has personally suffered at the hands of the Nazis. Now his hate and sadness are raging. His road to becoming an effective soldier is almost complete. The next scene is the most famous of the movie, the battle with the Tiger Tank. As Norman is basically a passenger in this one, and it has been extensively reviewed, I will not cover it except for this one point. Norman is terrified during the battle as he cannot really do anything with his little 30 caliber machine gun, and after seeing three other tanks destroyed, he knows there's no safety inside of Fury, not in this battle. But after the Tiger Tank is knocked out, when the Nazi officer attempts to dismount through the top hatch, Norman does not hesitate to gun him down. Now he's a soldier. As the last tank remaining, Fury has to guard a crossroads by itself. This is going to be a defensive battle, but they run over a landmine which costs them any mobility. As they scout the local building, Grady tells Norman that he realizes that Norman is a better person, and we're led to understand that this is why Grady has always hated him. Grady is insecure about his lack of education, below average intelligence, and overall low station in life. In what could have been a mopey moment, Norman wisely just lets it go. Since Norman knows nothing about tank repair, he's given the important job of lookout. This is a sign of trust as many tank crews were killed outside of their tanks while doing repairs or on guard duty. He dutifully heads off to the high ground in the woods. When he sees a large group of WAP and SS coming their way, he reports in. There's no time to repair the tank, but there's also no one else between the Nazis and the Americans' vulnerable rear area. War Daddy elects to stay and fight it out, but tells the crew to run for the rear and possible safety. This is where Norman's journey comes to maturation. He is the one who refuses to leave. Like War Daddy and the rest of the crew, he has no illusions about what this means. They've seen their last sunrise. The rest of the crew realize that Norman is now a part of the family, and families stick together. Grady is the last one to sign on and is brought to tears coming to grips with what this means. Facing danger is one thing, but now death is a virtual certainty. Once he signs on, his attitude changes. Once they accept that they're already dead, they can focus on their work. They rapidly prep the tank to play possum, and as they wait inside, they bond over a bottle of alcohol and christen Norman with his nickname, Machine. He is now Norman Machine Ellis. His acceptance into the family is complete. Bible recites a verse from scripture. Then I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. War Daddy identifies it as Isaiah chapter 6. As long as they have known War Daddy, they had no idea he knew scripture. In fact, up to this time, he's been a bit of an enigma. What was cut from the movie, but on the DVD deleted scenes, was War Daddy giving Norman his backstory. His massive burn scars were not from the war, but from a vehicle accident he had before the war. His girlfriend was killed in the accident and he's borne the guilt of that ever since. Her memory still haunts him, and he never really expected to survive the war. And I do not think he even wanted to, but he wanted his men to survive. The final battle is actually initiated by Norman. When a Nazi opens the assistant driver hatch, Norman kills him with a submachine gun, thus kicking off the battle. The ensuing battle has come under great criticism for technical reasons, but that's not the purpose of this video. As a former infantryman, I can offer arguments on both sides but from a character development standpoint, I see it as this. The crew is effective because they are once again a cohesive team. Between War Daddy's investment in both measured brutality and concern, his guidance and patience, Norman has evolved into a soldier, but devolved somewhat as a civilized man. He's reached a balance. He still has his native humanity, but is also capable of rising to challenge a threat. No more running from trouble, or acting if it is someone else's job to protect him. He is now rounded out, complete. In the ensuing battle, Norman distinguishes himself, as does the rest of the crew. 
This is where we are introduced to two more anonymous characters, the German counterparts to both Norman and War Daddy. There is a cool and calculating German sniper that mortally wounds War Daddy, which precipitates the end of the battle. The sniper lifts his mask so that we can see he is an older, no doubt, highly experienced soldier, just like War Daddy. Norman, who is now the only other surviving member of the crew, wants to surrender, but a mortally wounded War Daddy says, please don't do that. They'll hurt you bad, then they'll kill you bad. As the Germans toss grenades in the tank, War Daddy tells Norman to go out the bottom escape hatch. And as a technical matter, German grenades did have long burn fuses on them, so he would have very likely had time to get out the bottom. Norman tries to hide in the landmine crater, and then we are introduced to his German counterpart. A young Waffen SS soldier sees him under the tank. Norman, with his hands up and a look of genuine terror in his eyes, just pleadingly nods, no. The soldier smiles and you don't know if he's going to shoot Norman or report him. The soldier, who like Norman seems young and even innocent, for reasons unknown, just walks off. Perhaps he had seen what the SS did to prisoners and like Norman found it repugnant. Or maybe he just figured this terrified little guy was no threat and decided to show a little mercy. It is left for us to wonder. The next morning, Norman gets back in the tank and covers War Daddy's body when he hears sounds on the top of the tank. He grabs War Daddy's revolver, which we get a good look at for the first time. The grips have the picture of a woman's face, probably his dead girlfriend, showing that War Daddy really did carry her with him. Norman prepares to defend the tank, but when the hatch opens, it's an American soldier. Norman's helped out of the tank, checked out by medics, while still clutching War Daddy's revolver. They put him in an ambulance and send him to the rear. And as he drives away, he looks at the remains of Fury, which is now a tomb for his newly found and newly lost family. The old Norman is gone forever, the innocence of youth crushed by the needs of war. In a few short days, he has suffered more loss than he could have ever imagined in his previous life. Stripped of his innocence, he will walk the earth until his last day with the heavy weight of his memories. He is an old man at 20 years of age, and as Bible warned him, he can never escape having seen what a man can do to another man. The titular Fury will likely be dragged off to a depot area, her dead crew removed and buried in Europe possibly to never return to their homeland. The tank will be washed out and rebuilt or stripped for spare parts. There can be no sentimentality for this was total war.